Tonight, we're here to learn about the inner workings of a corporation that connects, surveils, parses, and sells the digital lives of nearly three billion people. And who better to tell this story than Wired's editor-at-large and a writer whom the Washington Post has called America's premier technology journalist. Stephen Levy is the author of seven books, including In the Plex, How Google Thinks, Works, and Shapes Our Lives, Crypto, How the Code Rebels Beat the Government, Saving Privacy in the Digital Age, and Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution, named by PC Magazine as the best sci-tech book of the last 20 years. His latest work, Facebook, The Inside Story, charts the supranational rise of the social media platform from the dorms of Harvard to becoming one of the world's most valuable corporations. A reviewer in the San Francisco Chronicle calls the book even-handed and devastating. Tonight, Mr. Levy will be in conversation with Michael Smirkanish, host of the Michael Smirkanish program on Sirius XM POTUS channel 124, and a host of CNN's Smirkanish on Saturday mornings. He's also a New York Times bestselling author. His most recent book is Clowns to the Left of Me, Jokers to the Right, American Life in Columns. Please welcome Stephen Levy and Michael Smirkanish. So I have a leg up on everybody in that the book just dropped yesterday. It's nearly 600 pages, but I read in advance. And it's extraordinary. It's a wonderful read. And what occurred to me as I was reading it, Stephen, is that it needed to be approachable for someone at my level of sophistication, which is down here somewhere, although I'm a Facebook user, but you also needed to have enough substance in it to appeal to people with more technical sophistication. How much of a challenge was it for you to reach both audiences? Um, I'm kind of used to it. I, I, I write about technology, and you have to gear up, even though I'm an English major, uh, to be able to understand these people sometimes. I've, I've sat down with a lot of people who aren't used to talking to journalists. But when I write, I, I've written for places like Newsweek, which is a really great training for being comprehensible and taking these uh, complicated technical matters and just breaking it down to what matters to civilians. Uh, and in this case, uh, there were a couple times where I felt I really had to just tiptoe into the weeds a little uh, in order to tell a necessary part of the story, but I tried to keep that to a minimum. So let's get right to it. Zuckerberg says it is not true that he started Facebook to get girls. <laughs> what did you find? Well, uh, I asked to go with Zuckerberg on, on this. He had a girlfriend at the time um, who is now his wife. I was surprised to learn just how many people were working at the same time on a similar vision, but he beat them. That's right. So social networking uh, began actually you know, a few years before uh, in the 90s from a company that invented it and actually kind of worked out the grammar of social networking. It was, it was called Six Degrees, but it was too early. Uh, you couldn't, for instance, send a picture because you know, we didn't have phones, and you couldn't take a picture, and things were very slow on the internet. So they died, and uh, it wasn't until the early 2000s uh, when Zuckerberg awakened to it that there were companies like Friendster and MySpace that were like, way ahead of him, but he figured out uh, how to get the dials just right and you know, wound up vanquishing uh, the other component, the other I don't, competitors. I don't want to give away too much, but you, you begin by talking about Andrew Weinrich, you circle back to him at yeah. the end. Explain who he is. So Andrew Weinrich is the founder of Six Degrees, which was the first social media company. And he came across with the idea of making friends with your connections and uh, just a lot of the things that we think are part of social networking today, part of Facebook really, but MySpace and Friendster use them too. Um, and he got the patents for them too, which you know, maybe we could talk about uh, what happened to those. And uh, towards the end of my research, I decided I wanted to visit him again. <laughs> and, uh, Any bitterness on his part that he missed this? Well, that's this? what I wanted to find out. I mean, here's a, a guy who's worth $60 billion uh, on his, using his idea. 
And he professed that, no, I'm not bothered. But on the other hand, when I'd meet with Mark Zuckerberg, we'd be meeting in you know, like a multi-million dollar office building designed by Frank Gehry with people buzzing around. Them. And I met with Andrew in a WeWork. <laughs> you describe in the book a, quote, large population of unhappy people who got enormously rich off Mark Zuckerberg. I'm not sure if this is one of the unhappy people, but my favorite example of those who made a lot of money because they got caught up in it or played an ancillary role, the graffiti artist. <laughs> yeah, he, he wasn't as grateful as you might think. So he, this is a guy, David Cho, who is a graffiti artist, uh, who they asked to just write in his scrolls or um, some of it was pretty misogynistic, actually, on the walls of the original Facebook office. And um, he thought he'd do it for a, a few hundred dollars. They said, why don't you take some stock? And it became worth $200 million. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I assume that, that he many... He wasn't that unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> I assume that many who are here tonight and many who will read the book have seen the movie Social Network. And I remember being intrigued in social network and, and much more interested because of your level of detail in all of your reportage about what went on in suite H33 at Kirkland House. Among other things, here's what I want to know. Who missed the boat? Who was there at ground zero and today really does regret that they didn't play a role? Well, there was a guy named Joe Green. So there was, uh, Mark was in a suite of four people. Uh, his roommate was a guy named Chris Hughes, who is, is one of those uh, unhappy people who's worth $500 million, who's now trying to break up Facebook. Um, and Joe was in the room next door. There was a fire exit door uh, between the, the, his suite and Mark's suite that was always open. And you know, uh, Joe helped out with, with a lot of stuff. Um, but uh, Joe's father, uh, was a, also a professor who was visiting, and he, he didn't like Mark. Um, and at the time that Mark was under uh, investigation by Harvard, you know, he told Joe to stay away from this guy. And as a result, Joe did not become one of the co-founders of Facebook. Facebook was founded in 2004. You first met Mark Zuckerberg at a PC forum in 2006. He was 21 years old. Was there something about him when you first interacted with him that caused Stephen Levy to think, this guy is really on the verge of something big? Well, actually, the very first time I met him, I thought, this guy is on the verge of being really strange. Uh, <laughs> How come? Uh, you know, I wanted to meet him because his company was taking off. I was writing a cover story for Newsweek at the time about something called Web 2.0, which was uh, you know, all these sites that use social connections, uh, not like Facebook, but you know, to share things uh, like photos or things like that, like Flickr. And I thought it would be good to meet him. MySpace actually was one of the companies that we included in this. Um, and uh, we arranged a meeting. It was at this conference. So we were gonna sit at a big round table uh, during the lunch period. And I asked him a couple of softball questions about uh, how many people were on his, uh, his platform and uh, stuff like that. And he didn't answer me. He just stared at me. And, you know, it's like time is standing still and he's looking at me. And I'm thinking, this is uh, uh, strange. Did I say something to offend him? Is he going through some sort of episode? And it took a while before him just to get him talking and to say the most cursory things about his company. Um, and uh, he's evolved quite a lot as an interviewee since then. In other words, that, that was part of his affect at the time, is that he would take his time and gather his thoughts before he would respond. Yeah, I, I've talked to a number of people who had that similar experience. You know, Don Graham, who was the CEO of the Washington Post at the time, actually my boss at the time, uh, said he had the same experience. Um, and, you know, uh, it is disconcerting. And people wonder sometimes whether it was a, a tactic to throw people off. I'm not quite sure about that, but I think that um, he couldn't have ignored the effect it had on people. You interviewed Mark Zuckerberg seven times. You had a lot of access to, to Facebook at all mm -hmm. levels. Sheryl Sandberg also gave you a lot of time. What was the deal? What was the understanding going into the project? So the deal with them was they would give me access to their executives. Uh, including Mark and Cheryl. They didn't promise me a set number of interviews, but 
they said that you'd probably get some. Um, I gave up, there was no string, other strings otherwise. Uh, I, I didn't have to show them a book in advance. Um, uh, they weren't committed to a, a number of interviews. Um, but the implicit promise, and I think this came because they knew who I was and, and knew my work, and I knew what, that they were giving up something to talk to me, was that I'd be fair. What, what do you think Zuckerberg, Sandberg, and others at the highest level of the company will think of the book? I think they'll, I think, they'll think it's tough but fair. I think that um, they won't like some things in it. And actually, they actually gave a statement saying they don't like some things in it, but uh, they didn't say uh, I treated them unfairly. The New York Times online yesterday, I assume it'll be in print tomorrow. I don't think I saw it yesterday, and I know I didn't see it today. It'll be in print one, some Sunday, I mean, a couple Sundays from now. Okay. They think you went too light. You were mm -hmm. too easy on Facebook. What do you make of that review? What do you want to say to the Times? I... I wonder why um, I've probably gotten, you know, 13 or 14 reviews now, and they were the only place which didn't say uh, I was, I guess in the words of one reviewer, um, uh, you know, uh, what was it, uh, even-handed and devastating. Um, and, you know, just today I got two reviews, same thing. One even talked about the access issue and said, you know, but his ultimate, you know, conclusion is, you know, uh, extremely tough. And, you know, so that person was an outlier. Um, that's what happens, you know, in, in reviews. Sometimes, uh, like this one, you wind up, a person winds up talking about things that you didn't want in, that you didn't put in the book. And sometimes, as in this case, it just happens to be that person's specialty. Um, and this person went even farther by saying, gee, I was really unhappy that he didn't write about, like, this thing. And, you know, can she mention something? And then you'd think to it, and, gee, it was an article she wrote. I don't know. <laughs> Chapter six of the book, The Book of Change. To me, this was the most revelatory. Quote, I managed to get a 17-page chunk from what might be the most significant of his journals in terms of Facebook's evolution. I know you're not going to answer me, but I have to ask, how did you get it? Where did you get it? So this notebook was kind of legendary. And around that time, it weirdly it was around the time that he wasn't saying anything to me at the PC forum, uh, he was keeping a notebook. And he'd scroll on it all the time. People would see it. Someone told me they visited his apartment. They saw these little stack of notebooks. And uh, he wouldn't show the notebook physically to, to people. But sometimes he would copy some pages. Uh, in this notebook, he would do like product designs. He'd sketch out products, and he'd write about his vision for Facebook, what it would be like. And so I figured, well, if he made copies sometimes to, for people who were designing a product, um, this is what it should look like, or um, saying, here's an idea, maybe we'll start a discussion about this and then take it to the whiteboard. I figured maybe someone kept some of those pages. So every person who I thought might have copies of some of those pages, I would say, yeah, do you think you might have some? And they'd say, oh, I don't know. Uh, it might be buried. I'm not sure. I said, well, listen, here's my address. <laughs> if something were to arrive at my home, maybe even without a return address, <laughs> I wouldn't mind. And is that how you received it? Literally, that's how I received it. Is there any suspicion on your part that maybe the sender was one Mark Zuckerberg? No. <laughs> you do not believe that's a possibility. No, but, but here's the other thing. I had to get it checked to make sure it was genuine. Right. I didn't want to be, I worked for Newsweek, which once published the Hitler Diaries, and, which weren't the Hitler Diaries. So, uh, and they thought they vetted that pretty well. So I needed to make sure that it was actually from Mark's hand. So my last interview with him, I told him that I have pages from his, his notebooks. Now, these notebooks, we didn't mention, he said that he had destroyed these notebooks at a certain point. And some people told me he destroyed them because of legal reasons. And later he would tell me, actually, I destroyed them because you know, I was embarrassed by some things that came out uh, when I wrote at Harvard, uh, personal things. And I didn't want that to happen with my notebook. So I, and he asked to see the notebook when I told him about it. And I showed it to him. I had it on my phone. And he went into kind of a rapture 
like almost like he was back to those days when he was building a company and p legislators weren't screaming at him and you know, he didn't need bodyguards and all that other stuff. Are you convinced he destroyed them? I, I am. You I, are. You, are, you, are you? No, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not convinced he destroyed them. Why not? Um, I'm naturally a cynic <laughs> and I, I, I can understand why it, it would be so advantageous given the, you know, the size and the scope of Facebook and the litigation that now mm. surrounds it to have a very convenient answer of, I don't have them, I destroyed them. Uh, and then when I read the book and I thought, okay, the 17 pages, I mean, these, th just so the audience knows, again, because I've read the book and everybody will now be reading the book, it, it just dropped. I in this particular journal, he talks about open registration and the news feed. And for those who are really tuned in to Facebook, I can't think of two more subjects you'd really want to know about the origin. That's right. And it, it was amazing because he was redesigning Facebook uh, in that one journal. And, and that chunk, 17-page chunk, I got that. I also had in that 17 pages were three pages about this thing called dark profiles. Uh, it was sort of interesting because Facebook has always insisted that dark profiles don't exist on Facebook. But the one sentence that I found most interesting in the whole chunk was he was talking about opening up Facebook to the world and he worried that there might be privacy issues because people wouldn't be protected by the domain of the college that they were at. Um, and he asked himself a question, how do we make this seem secure even if it isn't? You talk in the book about exchanges, personal exchanges between Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs. And I, I'm really intrigued by that. I think the audience will be intrigued by that. What, what it must have been like to be a fly on the wall for Gates hmm. and Zuckerberg. Will you say a word about those two? So I interviewed uh, Bill about Mark. I actually once was witness to uh, a meeting between the two of them. I wrote a story for Wired in 2009 about, uh, it was an update of my book, Hackers, and I interviewed some of the people in the original book and then people who would have been in the book had I written it now, and, which was Mark, and we got together for a cover shoot for Wired. And you know uh, they have a lot in common, and Bill told me, he said, yeah, he is kind of a younger version of me in terms that he dropped out of Harvard, um, had this big uh, ambitious idea, and he made good on it, but he made sure he told me, he said, but I did more coding, let him know I said that. How about Steve Jobs? Well, the one time I, I heard Steve Jobs mention Mark, um, he uh, talked about you know, uh, how he admired him as a young entrepreneur. This is in the last years of Steve's life. Uh, uh, I was trying to get him to talk about uh, Facebook, so I was working on a story on it. Um, but there were you know, uh, interesting interactions between them, uh, particularly the time that uh, Facebook wanted to make its own phone. Uh, had that happened, I suspect that uh, the relationship between uh, Mark and Steve Jobs would have just like blown up and been very negative. That was and, in the very end of Steve's why, life. And why didn't that happen? You discuss it in the book. Why didn't that come to fruition? I think that was one time where Mark blinked. Um, Facebook had a prototype of the phone. It had an Intel chip in it. Uh, they had a top-notch designer uh, create the hardware. They had uh, prototypes made in China. But it would have took, taken billions of dollars worth of investment and the time Facebook was planning to go public. And I think that was maybe one time, maybe the only time, where he didn't execute on a big ambitious plan like that. Stephen, you, you really are the person who's trusted by these Silicon Valley titans. I, I remember interviewing you about the book you wrote in the Plex, where you were given this unfettered access to Google. I remember before that interviewing you when you wrote the perfect thing, a perfect thing, the perfect, the perfect, thing, the yeah. perfect thing about the iPod. And correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Steve Jobs give you a prototype and weren't you walking down the street and he called you and said, so what do you think of it? That exactly happened. I remember I was walking down Broadway, uh, listening to music uh, on my brand new um, iPod and you know, he wanted to know, how, how is it? You know? What, what, what is it? What, what is it that gives you this kind of access, do you think? Well, I've, I've been doing it for a while, so uh, they kind of like know me as a piece of furniture or something like that. Um, but uh, they, I've been, you know, I, I try to deal with people fairly. And sometimes I'll be tough, but um, they appreciate that. And, you know, um, 
I'm really interested in what they say, too. I'm, I'm well, not up to, for a gotcha. What about your level of, my kids think I'm a Luddite, okay? They, they treat me with, with technology. One of, one of them is here shaking his head, but I won't single him out. Um, but they look at me the way that I look at my mother yeah. when I'm trying to help her with her iPhone and so forth. Where do you come in on the scale of sophistication and knowledge? Well, I, I, I learn enough to get what they're saying and pass it through, right? Um, don't ask me to program anything, right? Um, I want to talk politics, uh, a subject of great fascination for me and I think for the audience given the timing as, as we are here at the, uh, if it's Zuckerberg, it's answer Steve it. Steve Jobs, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it were Steve Jobs. I wish it were Steve Jobs. Believe me, my God. Cool. He heard us. <laughs> so the conventional wisdom is that Donald Trump in 2016 had this organic, slapdash, highly dysfunctional campaign that Hillary was organized, sophisticated, the brightest minds. That was not the case, at least as it related to Facebook. Explain. So Facebook you know, uh, offers all candidates a, a platform for political ads. And if you use it a lot, like any advertiser, whether you're Procter & Gamble or a presidential campaign, they'll give you expertise and actual embed some of their people in your campaign to help you use the platform in the most intelligent way, in the most effective way. And the Clinton campaign turned them down. They said, we're not so interested in using this. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of our resources on Facebook. The Trump campaign, on the other hand, said that we're a Facebook first campaign. We're going to take every advantage we can on Facebook because we think we're going to get massive bang for our buck. We're going to use a lot of micro-targeting to do things that you couldn't have done before. The last person to go in that direction was Obama, but the Democrats went backward after Obama um, and the Trump campaign took the next step. You say several Facebookers worked virtually full-time advising Trump campaign on how to maximize their spending there were none with Clinton. Not because of favoritism being shown, but because this was business, they were a huge advertiser. Right, and there was an interesting dynamic in, with people at Facebook, most of whom were Clinton supporters. So they saw how the Trump campaign was playing Facebook like a Stradivarius. But they thought it was just an interesting phenomenon. And they were you know, sitting back in admiration. One of them told me that, you know, you know, he used the word, I probably don't want to repeat here, but it was something beautiful, you know, the, the way they used it uh, to sometimes putting up as much as 175 ads a day up there targeted different people. Wait, 175,000. Thousand. Thousand ads a day. Yeah, yeah, and these weren't ads that went to everyone. It was, you know, tailored for each person because they knew the Facebook information on that person, um, you know, because they could access it through Facebook. They didn't get hold of it though with Cambridge Analytica or something else, but um, then, you know, uh, and they could know if this person is interested in guns, this person is interested in uh, pro-abortion, anti-abortion, and they would try to find something to resonate uh, with that person and Trump, and if they found nothing resonated, a person wouldn't interact with the ad, they figured this person is never gonna vote for Trump, let's serve them ads that dissuade them from voting at all. And, and it's, it's not just, in, in, it's not just the, the ads, let's talk about the news feed. See, I, I think that we're all now at a point where we know, I, I'm in the market for a new car. Okay. I know that when I do some research online, in fact, it even occurs to me, do I wanna put this in a Google search? Because if I do, I will be bombarded with ads for cars, right? right? And I think, I think consumers yeah. now know, you're looking for a chair, maybe you're thinking of vacation, all of a sudden, they've got your number. But I think that people still don't realize that in the, the news feed, when you click on a story and you express an interest in a particular kind of story, you're now gonna be fed a steady diet of similar stories or stories that, that you know, the, the, the algorithm thinks you're going to enjoy. That's right. It, every time you interact with something, Facebook says, oh, this is what you like. Right. And they feed you more of it. Um, and sometimes 
even getting away from, from politics for a second, this could be in, in just like really like goofy, stupid stuff. That's why things that are sometimes silly uh, or, you know, heartwarming like a puppy or things like that go really viral on Facebook because you know, if you click on it once, it, you find it populating a lot on your newsfeed, and these items get a lot of clicks and proliferate throughout the whole system. And this is something that Facebook actually encouraged. Uh, uh, they switched their algorithms to have that happen more uh, at a period where Mark Zuckerberg was obsessed with Twitter. And he uh, was uh, worried about the competitive uh, nature of Twitter and wanted to, uh, first he tried to buy it, and then he said, we'll be a little more like Twitter and we'll encourage that kind of going viral that, that, that Twitter had. But it sort of changed the character of Facebook from something where you would get information from your friends and people you knew to people outside and allowed this sort of um, uh, uh, proliferation of stuff ranging from heartwarming stuff or silly stuff to fake news. But uh, you know, on one hand, I view that as an invasion of privacy of sorts, that they have my number. I guess from Facebook's standpoint, they think they're providing good, good service. Yeah, well, you're giving them your number by, by your behavior. And they feel that, hey, you're getting more relevant ads. But the, the fact is, when the information is used not to serve you something that you want to see, like the car you want to buy, but uh, manipulating you and to do something you don't want to do, which is stay home and not vote when actually you would prefer one candidate over the other, then that's not a good thing for people. Let, let me go back to something you, you, you made, a point you made a, a moment ago about voter suppression. So the Trump campaign, I just want to stick with the legitimate ways, the lawful ways in which the Trump campaign was able to utilize Facebook. So they were doing all this micro-targeting through the news feed, and, and if they figured out that you were probably a Hillary household, then what they would do, they wouldn't try and bring you out. They would try and hammer her through their messaging in a way that would keep you from voting, make right. you more disinclined. Yeah, hammer her or just get you disgusted in general. So they would target uh, African-American voters and, and point out things that made them feel more negative about Hillary. And, and all this is Brad Parscale at the Trump campaign working with Facebook representatives. Yeah, it was a relatively obscure at the time, um, you know, uh, digital marketer uh, and website designer. He actually got into the Trump camp by working on Trump's website um, and some of the Trump organization's uh, digital needs. Um, and you know, uh, people thought, wow, this Trump campaign, there's no, they're gonna go nowhere. This obscure guy in Texas is working with, with them, but he you know, broke convention to use Facebook uh, more extensively than it had been used in a campaign before. Okay, now I want to talk about the illegitimate uses of Facebook in the 2016 campaign. I just yeah. want to make sure I'm, I'm drawing a fine line between that which was lawful and, and that which was... Sometimes that line has to be pretty fine because, you know, there is, you know, it, sometimes it doesn't seem that different. Uh, well, here's what I'm thinking of. DC leaks. Mm -hmm. DC leaks and the Russian utilization of Facebook for that purpose, is it fair to say that the Russians for DC leaks, and maybe you should explain and remind people what that is, mm -hmm. but that the Russians utilized Facebook exactly as the engineers who set it up designed it. Right, so DC leaks was a page on Facebook that was designed to disseminate the hacked emails of the Democratic National John Party. Podesta, right. Risotto. Yeah, and you know, it was set up through um, you know, phony accounts uh, on, on Facebook, and when Facebook uh, discovered it, at first, you know, they didn't know that the account was set up by a Russian, but they were fine with an account on Facebook meant to disseminate all this, uh, you know, purloined emails. And, you know, later, when there was an outcry, they figured, oh, they looked into it, and they found it was inauthentic, and they took it down. But the real Russian push was through ads that they would take through a number of different pages that uh, would try to make people feel worse about the election. Again, actually doing the same uh, aims as the Parscale you know, operation did. Uh, but they went even farther. In one case, they uh, picked people who were against uh, immigration, and they said they, they were going to have a rally uh, at this town in Texas, and then they would do the same thing to people who, on the other side, you know, uh, pro-immigration people, and they try to make a phony event where two opposing sides would go and fight each other. And that would make people feel worse and you just cause general chaos. 
Let's talk about another component of what went wrong in 2016, fake news. Here's my favorite example from what you published in the book, page 358. The Denver Guardian. First of all, what is the Denver Guardian? Sounds real, doesn't it? Yeah, Sounds impressive. If you didn't live in Denver, you might think that's the newspaper in Denver. Um, but actually, the address uh, for that paper turned out to be a parking lot. And it was a creation made by someone whose job it is to make up phony publications, take a, a blog post from some obscure right winger and put it under that name and put it up on Facebook and uh, see, what that, see what comes of that. See so how many here's, an, they can get. here's a headline from the Denver Guardian. FBI agent suspected in Hillary email leaks found dead in apparent murder-suicide. Sounds awfully nefarious. 500,000 shares. The headline was viewed 15 million times. Talk about that. In the last weeks of the presidential election, fake news you know, just blossomed and proliferated because people would click on this stuff. And for things like the Denver Guardian, there was a financial component to it in that when you actually clicked on it, went to the page, it would serve you advertisements and the pe people posting the fake news would get a cut. Um, then on the other hand, there were the Russians posting as well. And Facebook was, uh, was faced with the decision of what to do about it. People were complaining about it in a way they never were before, even though there was a lot of fake news that happened on Facebook before the election, even things like anti-vax stuff uh, circulating that Facebook also knew about and didn't do much about. And uh, they decided to leave the stuff alone. In other words, they, Facebook, this is a really important part of the book and the discussion. So as all of these nefarious things are taking shape, I'll ask the question this way. How much of it was known to Facebook? Facebook knew, knew a lot of it. It was called to their attention, and, and they were able to see what happened. They knew that, that there was no Denver Guardian. How high did it go? Did Zuckerberg know? Did Sheryl Sandberg know? There was a meeting. Um, it was called the Sheryl meeting, a, a weekly meeting, where uh, Sheryl would meet with her top policy people. It was a conference between uh, Menlo Park, where Facebook headquarters is in Washington, and they talked about the fake news, and the head of the Washington you know, Policy Bureau um, this guy named Joel Kaplan uh, argued that we really have to keep this stuff up because we don't want to meddle with the election. And of course, doing nothing was a form of meddling with the election because they were allowing this fake news to uh, affect people. Well, was the logic the same within Facebook as it was in the Obama administration? And by that I mean that the Obama administration knew during the course of 2016 that the Russians were screwing with the election. But I think it's accurate to say that one of the reasons that they weren't more aggressive is they thought there would be a perception that they were putting their thumb on the side of the scale for Hillary, and therefore they took more of a hands-off approach. Was that the thinking in Menlo Park? It, it was the, what uh, I guess Joel used to convince them to keep hands off at, at that point. So you're right. It's a, it's a similar impulse that they didn't want to be accused by the right uh, of meddling, and you know, and Facebook made all kinds of concessions to the right because uh, they got a lot of heat from conservative legislators. At one point, they brought a whole bunch of conservative commentators to Menlo Park to, to meet with Mark and with Cheryl. Um, and you know, and I asked Mark about this uh, you know, because they knew that the charges made against them that they favored. Uh, liberal content on the newsfeed was false. He knew that, yet he would not say that to them. Um, he bent over backwards uh, to, I, I, I said when I talked about him, I felt he's bending over so backwards in his chair, I thought it would hit the floor uh, because he catered the conservative so much. In, in the case of the Denver Guardian, just to stay with this example still a moment, Denver. A, a moment <laughs> longer for, for fake news as an example, this, this emanated from Macedonia. There's right. a small town in Macedonia where a bunch of guys are now driving Mercedes as a result of putting out fake news. Fair to say, not with an objective of electing Donald Trump, but it was all about getting eyes on Facebook pages and making money. That's right. As it turned out, that putting out fake news that was anti-Hillary was much more profitable than fake news attacking Donald Trump. Uh, for some reason, uh, the conservatives like to click on that stuff more. Okay, Th third, third example of what went on relative to Facebook in 2016. Cambridge Analytica 
Remind everybody what that is. It began with a happiness quiz. That's right. So uh, Cambridge Analytica, to remind everyone, is a company that's uh, in, in Britain which uh, had a, a US branch funded by ultra right wing financier Robert Mercer. And they wound up getting hold of the personal information of 87 million Facebook users, 87 million profiles. And it all came from a survey from a Cambridge University researcher who got it, the information following Facebook's rules. And I actually figured out that Cambridge Analytica started in 2010 when Facebook decided to give away all that information to the people who wrote programs that ran on top of Facebook, software developers, uh, because they wanted to create a social operating system. So uh, when you signed up for an app on Spotify or something like that that ran on Facebook, you would click and say, okay, uh, I'll share my information with you, but you're also sharing the information of your friends. Every Facebook user has an average of 130 friends. So it doesn't take a lot of people, um, you know, a couple hundred thousand, to get a database of 87 million people. And then this researcher licensed it, and he did violate Facebook's terms of service to do this, licensed it to this company, Cambridge Analytica, which used it in his campaign uh, uh, to elect Donald Trump. Again, an instance where Facebook was very slow to react. That's right. Uh, now, Facebook knew about, well, certainly they, they, they knew about how much information they were giving away. They actually closed this uh, you know, uh, giveaway in 2014, but there was a loophole that they were allowed to continue for another year, and that was during that year that the information went to Cambridge Analytica. So they didn't act fast enough. But j just to illustrate, it would be as if I were able to get this room full of people in Philadelphia here right now to consent to the happiness quiz, right. and they would take it, and they would give consent, and they would answer questions. But now, by virtue of their having done so, I'm getting access to them and their friends. And it, you know what it reminds That's me right. of? That's right, we'd get hundreds of thousands of profiles if we just got your information for the people it reminds me it rem and, you, and the people you, you know, you'd be dropping a dime on your friends, giving me their, inf their information, and they'd never know it. It reminds me, I'm going to date myself with this, of a commercial. I think it was shampoo, a subject I don't know a great deal about. <laughs> but it was a commercial that said, and she told two people, and she told two people, and she, t and then all of a sudden there's like this grid. Anybody remember? And there are a lot of female faces suddenly on the screen about the growth exponentially. And that's the way this worked up until 87 million individuals' information was then there to be picked apart, again, for political purpose. Right, and, and to be fair, no one really knows how much that information was used by Cambridge Analytica. There's a big debate about whether the Trump campaign actually used those exact profiles, but I think just the idea that if that information you know, was used at all, it, it, it could be so effective in targeting ads to people. Okay, so I, I've very quickly, this is the Cliff Notes edition, okay. but I've run through the legitimate way in which Facebook was used by the Trump campaign in 2016. Then I've talked about the Russian manipulation via DC leaks. I've talked about fake news. I've also talked about Cambridge Analytica. What I most want to know from Stephen Levy is, how prepared is Facebook to police the 2020 campaign? So Facebook is under tremendous pressure uh, to uh, close these uh, uh, like loopholes and you know, uh, not let 2016 happen again. Uh, so they put a lot of measures into effect. Um, they had a little more success in subsequent elections like the midterms, French election, Mexican election. But uh, in 2020, the people who abused the platform then are gonna be trying new things. So Facebook fought 2016's war and fixed it, and it's unclear whether they're going to be able to adapt to new attacks from the adversaries. Well, one more subject, uh, if, if I might, and then I'm going to surrender the floor so that folks in the audience have the opportunity to ask questions, but this is really important. I think having read the book and tried to understand some of these privacy issues uh, and the regulation issues, it occurs to me just how gargantuan a task it is to moderate content. Right. And you, in the book, talk about this effort 
and you had this really interesting experience of going to Phoenix. Yeah. What, go, what went on? I know they, they closed that, but right. what went on in Phoenix? Please describe that. So Facebook has tens of thousands of people who actually aren't technically Facebook employees. The Facebook hires companies to hire them to sit in, you know, like a, before a, a screen all day and look at content which is reported either by uh, people who are offended by it uh, or you know, just blown away by how you know, awful it was. Um, and it's artificial intelligence which flagged it. And to say, uh, according to Facebook rules, should this go up, should this go down, um, they got like 40 seconds to make a decision. And, you know, they go through thousands of uh, pieces of content a day. Um, and it's, it's almost like a war zone. You sit there with the stuff coming at you there. And I think in, in that and in a lot of things that we're talking about here, it came about because Facebook grew and, you know, and growth was a big intention. It was something that Mark really wanted to do, you know, uh, grow according to his motto, move fast and break, break things. things. Right. And the growth came so quickly and they rushed ahead so much that they didn't account for the consequences of this growth. And one of them would be to have billions of pieces of content that you have to look at in order to see what is going to make Facebook unsafe. You know, and, and what's going to threaten the users, what's going to be hateful speech, which is going to bully people, um, terrorist content, which actually Facebook got pretty good at uh, using AI. But, you know, uh, but it, it's a task that it'll never be perfect at, and it's always going to be a lot of stuff which is disturbing well, on Facebook. It's, it reminds me of Potter Stewart famously saying about pornography, I know it when I see it. Some of these things are so very hard to define. There's a whole discussion in your book about men are scum. Yeah. And why men are scum needs to come down, even though you would think, well, okay, offensive, but you're not going to take that down. But you have to take it down when you start formulaically thinking about what right. should and should not be posted. L one last thing. Yeah. I, I, could, I could do this for hours with you because I'm t so totally taken with the subject matter. But people here and who are listening and who will watch need to know. So you go through all this with Mark Zuckerberg. You, know, you, you address the very heady privacy implications. And he says to you, we were too idealistic and optimistic about the ways people would use technology for good and didn't think enough about the ways that people would abuse it but he believes that their conduct was not due to complacency or greed. Did you find him convincing? Well, um, I, I believe that uh, it wasn't you know, greed in the fact that he wanted to accumulate money, but it was greed and he wanted to accumulate users. Right. And, and, and it wasn't like that he didn't know because, you know, I document multiple times before Facebook would do X or Y, people around Mark, his, his top lieutenants in some cases, would say, Mark, um, this isn't a good idea. Or sometimes, Mark, this is wrong. And he would say, we'll do it anyway. Um, his view was that if you go ahead and do it, uh, you could fix things later. You could apologize later. Uh, so uh, he wanted to move fast even if it broke things. Thank you all for being here, by the way. It, it's, it's a hell of a book, and it's so insightful about um, so many aspects of our lives. Uh, you know, it's, it's a much bigger story than, well, I, than I Facebook. Wanted to, I wanted to do it because Facebook is so important to our lives. You know, the yes. billions of people are on it. If it was a country, it would be the biggest country in, in the world. And, uh, and tackling this, you know, it, was, it was fascinating even before this stuff happened after the election, but researching it while Facebook was going through this huge crisis was, you know, uh, doubly fascinating and, and I, I felt it was an important story that had to be told you know on one hand and it's important to say that all this is going on while Facebook's revenues keep going up and up and up so its stock market price is still very very blue chip while its reputational price is penny stock thank you I was wondering does Facebook see itself as responsible for what it will do with the acquired information about individuals in other words that information can be stored and so, what will they do with it in the future? Where is the information and how can it be used against well, people? Right, great question. So Facebook uh, keeps the information. One thing that Facebook does not do, and sometimes is accused of, is sell the information to outside brokers. But it, it keeps the information. They have had data breaches in the past. Um, so uh, they haven't been perfect in keeping that information secure. Now, let's say at some point in the future, uh, 
Facebook doesn't do well and it, someone buys it, um, that information is up for grabs. I mean, whoever buys it uh, gets hold of that information. It's the property of Facebook. Yeah, there's been talk of breaking Facebook up into several components. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? What would it look like? Yeah, there, well, there, there is a, actually an antitrust investigation going on now, and a lot of people, uh, some regulators, and Chris Hughes, one of the first founders, we mentioned him earlier, uh, advocates that. So Facebook bought these companies um, over the last uh, 10 years. Instagram, you know, wildly popular. Some people feel it's more popular than Facebook uh, itself, the blue app now. Uh, and they say that they should break up Facebook, move Instagram away, move uh, WhatsApp away. Um, I think it'll, if that happens, it'll take a very long time and, uh, for that to happen, and Facebook will push back really, really hard. I mean, it's like, like take many years for that to happen. And Microsoft, which I, I covered that uh, trial, Microsoft was guilty of antitrust, and the judge ruled that you, you had to uh, break up part of it, uh, and they waited till the next administration, which let them off the hook. So uh, I think the only way that that would happen, and I don't think this is actually impossible, uh, even though you know, uh, he's not planning to do it now, is if Mark felt that, gee, you know what, we actually could thrive doing this, that you know, uh, it might be better for us to spin these off and have three great companies uh, moving. And maybe Mark wouldn't choose to stick with Facebook. Maybe he'd be the CEO of Instagram there. Can I just say, relative to Zuckerberg, Facebook, and dealings with Washington, we sell ads, Senator. Yeah. Right? If there were ever a moment that sort of showed a disconnect between yeah. the, the, the knowledge. First, the first time he went before congressional hearings, you know, we got a breathtaking look at how clueless a lot of our legislators were about the way things operate. And it was Warren Hatch who asked that question. I don't understand. You're, you're free. You, how do you make money? He said, Senator, we sell ads. <laughs> and that phrase wound up on a T-shirt at Facebook headquarters. I wanted to ask a, not a Zuckerberg question, but a Sheryl Sandberg question. Uh, her like Democratic bona fides are really quite deep. I mean, studying under Larry Summers, you know, she herself was talked about as a cabinet official, but clearly it would have been with the Democratic administration. Could you just give us a little bit of sense of where is she weighing in? I mean, I, I understand she's the number two person there, and, and in these policy discussions, should we be pulling back to meddle, not to meddle? If we reduced uh, the presence of a more conservative footprint on Facebook, is that its own form of meddling? Where is she in these discussions? And, and could you give us a sense of her as an influence on him, he being the ultimate decision maker? So uh, when Cheryl came on, it was a great get for Facebook uh, in 2008. Uh, she and Mark uh, had an, an arrangement where she wouldn't be his lieutenant um, at his side for everything. They would essentially split the company up. That Mark would keep all the product stuff, the stuff that really interested him, the engineering and the AI, that's all in Mark's world. And Cheryl would take all the stuff that Mark wasn't interested in, like sales and policy um, and Washington relations and communications, HR, all that, all that, all that stuff and try to keep it out of Mark's, you know, uh, not to hide it from him, but not take up his attention with it, that, that she would be, uh, take care of that stuff herself. Now that wound up biting back when it turned out those things reached a, such a high priority that Mark had to deal with it. And when it came to the, to the Russians' interference, uh, the guy, uh, the chief security officer who reported up the chain to Cheryl was so frustrated that uh, Mark wasn't hearing about it, that he wrote a report and sent it to all the people who work with Mark. Uh, in order to get Mark's uh, attention. Um, in, in terms of the, the, the conservatives, you know, uh, Cheryl was the, the person who appointed that guy, Joel Kaplan. She used to date him in college. He was one of the people called Friends of Cheryl Sandberg at Facebook. And she listened to him a lot, and I think delegated a lot of attention to uh, uh, a lot of uh, responsibility to him. And uh, you know, uh, the other thing, and this is tragic, is uh, a year before the election, uh, Cheryl lost her husband. And, you know, he was a, a fantastic guy, and they had a wonderful relationship. And she wrote a book about it. Uh, uh, and she was, for a period, thrown off her game. And when she got back, uh, she had done such a good job building her organization that uh, it ran pretty well without her in some aspects. So uh, maybe she wasn't on top of things as she should have been. Stephen, 
so many of the companies, there's such change that comes from these pages of Facebook or Zuckerberg, they've acquired this business or they've acquired this business. And meanwhile, you tell us a story about somebody else. The aim seems most of the time to create a product and cash in. And yet here he is, Zuckerberg, still at the helm, still running Facebook, still in total control. Do you see a day where he decides, hey, there's nothing left for me here and I'm ready for no challenge or a new challenge? Well, he's always looking far ahead. He bought uh, this virtual reality company, Oculus, um, in uh, 2014, I believe, uh, for $2 billion because he thought in 10 years that's going to be like, like the next mobile computing, the next big platform, and he wanted to own it essentially, um, when that happened. Um, and, you know, uh, two words that I've never heard at Facebook are succession plan. So maybe that's interesting. How secure is Facebook? I'm thinking of ransomware. I'm thinking of attacks to destroy files. How vulnerable are they? Well, I, I, they haven't given me a glimpse inside their code. Um, or allowed me to red team their, you know, uh, their processes. But I would suspect they're as, as good as any other company in Silicon Valley in, in that. Um, as a matter of fact, one problem with the 2016 election is that that was what they were protecting against. They weren't looking at Russian disinformation campaigns. They were worried about Russians uh, pretending to be Facebook users and hacking into people's accounts. And uh, that turned out to be not so much a problem as the misinformation. In other words, the, the content seems to run more a risk being removed where, based on where it came from rather than what it is. Did I say that clearly? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's exactly it. That, you know, the same thing that an American citizen would post, uh, and it would be okay, even if it was fake. Uh, Facebook would say, that's in the rules, no problem. Um, but if a, a Russian pay, uh, did it and paid with rubles as they did 2016 election, no, you, you, you can't do Although that. Although the same rules don't apply to all of us, I, I would be governed by a different standard than Donald Trump, right? Mm -hmm. They are loath to, to get in well, his way. Well, politicians actually, in taking ads, are treated actually in a special way that Facebook doesn't even fact check them. So one thing Facebook does do to suppress news, and they have worked to suppress it, they brought the percentage down, is that uh, they have fact checkers. And when something you know, explodes on Facebook, they'll have a fact checkers look, and if the fact checkers say it's false, the first thing they did was they said, that they tried is to say, um, you know, let's report that fact checkers have determined that this is questionable or, or this isn't true, that people clicked on it more. So now, they, now they, they let you mouse over and see, oh, there is no such thing as a Denver Guardian. Or they might give a couple other legitimate news articles that um, contradict it, or they might actually give it a lower ranking in the news feed so not so many people see it. But um, if for politicians taking ads, they do not fact check it. it it's, it's and, and, and Zuckerberg has said he'll let the people decide uh, what, whether what politicians say is true or not. In, in terms of what gets the most attention, it's a tale as old as time. You know, rumor and, and innuendo and scandal and lies in like a whisper down the lane. He's, he's created the ultimate whisper down the lane mechanism and it, it sometimes plays to our worst instincts. Here, I, here's a question that I wrote for you that I, I did not ask. Um, I said, Facebook is a window into who we are. You know the old question, fundamentally speaking, is man basically good or bad? What does Facebook tell us the answer is? Well, the abiding belief early in Facebook was that people are good. If you connect the world and people share with each other, good things will come of it. When Arab Spring happened, they were patting each other on the back, high-fiving all over. And now, it, that, that doesn't seem so. It seems that, you know, uh, and this isn't uh, because of Facebook, it's because of who we are connecting each other has negative implications. People use it to bully each other. People use it to spread rumors that cause violence. People have died because of, of things that have happened. Dictators one, one use it to stay in power. Right, right. And it's not that Facebook is responsible for human beings being you know, bad in, in, in a lot of cases, but Facebook is responsible 
for not anticipating what happens when you spread something like that and give people power to, to, to spread their word, fake or not, uh, all, all over the world. Facebook is responsible for what it is. I have a question about the political landscape now, given Facebook and social media. Um, things have changed. And the question is, have they changed enough that the old rules don't apply? Um, I ran for Congress years ago. I was told a third of the people wouldn't vote for a Democrat if he was Jesus Christ, and a third of the people wouldn't vote for a Republican if he was Jesus Christ or she was Jesus Christ. So you aim for the middle, and I'm wondering if the rules have changed, that you don't aim for the middle, but rather you try to dig deeper into your side in the hope that you can get the extra 4% to vote and prevent 2% safe not voting on the other side. Well, I, I, I think that's not, you know, uh, that the phenomenon is, isn't a, a Facebook issue, but Facebook can amplify the, that and, and, and make it easier if you're, you know, uh, thinking divisively to implement a policy like that. Finally, this is Philadelphia. So it is Philadelphia. The way in which the book is dedicated, in memory of Lester Levy, 1920, 2017, sorry you didn't see that Super Bowl, Dad. Mm. Mm. Want to say something about that? Yeah, my father, actually, in the last years of his life, he lived like literally a block from here at the watermark. Uh, he died at 96 years old. Huge Eagles fan. And he died early in the season that it was their championship season and didn't get, get to see that. Um, if you remember that season, there was a game, um, maybe a few games in, they weren't doing that great, and people wondered whether the season would be lost. It was the Giants game. And uh, it looked like they weren't doing well. At the very end, they got, you know, maybe the 40-yard line or something, and the game was going to be over. And this young rookie they had was going to kick a field goal. And uh, Jake Elliott, he got up and he, lifted it up, and it's a 61-yard field goal that just made it over. And I thought, maybe my dad helped push that one over. So, so Congratulations, this book, this Stephen. It's a great yeah. book. Thank, Thank you, you, ladies and gentlemen.